Okay, number seven uh, session for today. This is one I just wanted to have a little bit of fun with, and it's designed to be a little shorter. The conspiratorial logic of the Da Vinci Code and Jesus bloodline theorists. You know, up until this point, it's been a lot of nuts and bolts, a lot of this text says this, this text says that. And again, I, my style is, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but I try to give you the primary sources, give you good secondary sources so that you can check up on me. You know I'm not making it up. Just go and look. Uh, you know, that, that's what we're all supposed to do. For this one, though, I, I wanted something, when I, when I sat down and I thought about this, I, I wanted something that would be a little lighter, but I think equally important. And that is to talk a little bit about what you, the reader, the recipient of Dan Brown's work, and especially his sources again, Michael Bajan, and uh, Richard Lee and Henry Lincoln, and of course, Picknett and Prince and other writers, what are they asking you to believe? When it really comes down to it, how are they asking your mind to work? And I want to go through and make a few logic statements that illustrate to you what you really have to believe. How do you really have to think to accept what they're giving you? And I've titled it Conspiratorial Logic of the Da Vinci Code. Or, <laughs> how finding people in the publishing industry who can't think critically will pave your way to a bestseller. Or, how speaking in a British accent masks non sequitur arguments. And that is particularly aimed at Michael Bajant, again, not Dan Brown. Bajant is, I think, the leading person here who really tries, <laughs> really tries to put one over on us, of course. This is not Michael Bajan, Henry Lincoln, and Richard Lee. Frankly, we would do better with the lone gunman. But I want to take a look at what they do and consider it all as one big non sequitur. What is a non sequitur? Latin, of course, that means it does not follow a statement that does not logically follow from what preceded it. Or put another way, a conclusion that does not follow from the preceding premises. And let's go through a few examples. Here's what they want you to accept. Ask yourself, for all of these, does this make sense? If a document is old, it must be true. Is that true? Oh, but we were told right here on the front cover The discovery of the gospel of Judas is astonishing. This will change the way we all look at Christianity. Now, to say that, and of course, in respect to the gospel of Judas, what they really are saying is that since we found this new gospel that's really old, and of course it's not as old as the New Testament, but we found it so that gives it validity. It's just not logical. If a newly discovered document disagrees with previously known documents, it must be true. Does that make any sense? This is what they're saying, though. The Nag Hammadi material disagreed with the New Testament material. We, you know, the Nag Hammadi stuff must be right. It contains the truth. It contains the unaltered story. What they're really saying when they say that is this. If a newly discovered document disagrees with the ones we know before, must be true. Documents which exist in only a few copies must have been suppressed. Well, there aren't many of these Nag Hammadi Gospels, or there's only one of the Gospel of Judas, or it took us this long to find it. That's proof that the, the evil Orthodox Church must have been suppressing and destroying all these other ones. Does that make any sense? Must that necessarily and logically follow? No, it is a non sequitur. By the way, exploring that logic, Herodotus, the history, Thucydides, look how many copies. Eight, eight, seven. 
Here we get down to one partial, 19 for Livy, 20 for Tacitus, Pliny, 7. This is an old figure now. The New Testament's pushing 6,000 now. But the point, of course, is that there's no evidence that if something like Plato only exists in seven copies, that anyone was out there destroying the other ones. It's a non sequitur. It does not follow. It is not coherent thinking. If, a doc, if document A and document B are about the same person, the document farthest removed from that person's time must be true. Well, the New Testament Gospels and the Nag Hammadi Gospels are about Jesus, and the Nag Hammadi Gospels are older, but those are the ones that are true. Again, does it make any sense? Does it necessarily follow? No. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to reduce their claims to just simple propositions. That you can see the illogic and the muddled thinking that must be embraced to think this way, the way they want you to think. If the, con if the content of a document about a religious issue is controversial, it must be true. The Gospel of Judas will change everything. They're implying, of course, that that's the real one. Why? Because, well, it's, it doesn't say what all the other ones say, and it's really controversial. That must be the truth. It must have just been suppressed. Come on. The opinion of the majority in a religious issue must be wrong and must have been arrived at in a power struggle. I mean, it's just inconceivable that a lot of people, the majority, could have actually agreed peaceably. And that's how the majority formed. Why is that inconceivable? Again, if you accept the conspiratorial thinking, this is what you're asked to affirm. If one person who believes something behaves badly, then most or even all of the people who share that belief would approve of that behavior or behave the same way. Well, we know that there were early church fathers, early Christians, who didn't have nice things to say about the role of women. That must mean that most Christians think that way and that this characterizes the church. That must mean that Gnosticism you know, is, is just the way to go because they had so much of a more enlightened view. Just because one person thinks one thing and that one person is a member of a group does not mean that everyone else in the group thinks the same thing. How simple and elementary can it be? But this is what you're asked to believe. You're asked to swallow this. A person or group of persons who behave badly can't be correct, especially when it comes to religious truth. So what we're saying here is that we can judge the veracity of an idea by virtue of the way a person behaves. Is that necessarily true? No. He or she could just be a dork. But the dork might actually be right on whatever given issue it is. Okay? We all know dorky people who get things right. You, know, you and I might be among them. <laughs> I can speak with authority on this one. Anyone who opposes an idea has an ax to grind. There can't be any substance to what he or she is saying. So if I object to the idea, let's say, that the Nag Hammadi Gospels are unaltered truth, if I object to that, I must have an ax to grind. I really can't be saying that because of historical records and circumstances. Surely, the majority view, the Orthodox you know, Christians, surely they had an ax to grind, and that's why things turned out the way they did. Again, this is so clearly incoherent, but this is exactly what you're asked to believe. People in power cannot be trusted when they say something is true. Therefore, people not in power 
can be trusted when they say something is true. Right? I'm sure we all know this by life experience, don't we? It's just silly. How about this one? God approves of everything in the Bible. Does he? Aren't there bad things recorded in the Bible? Well, of course. Does that mean God approves of everything? Or is it just describing the way things are or the way things were? Does it have to have some blessing pronounced upon it just because it's in the Bible? No. Everything in the Bible is prescriptive, they want us to believe. That means it's prescribed, it's, it's doctrine, it's, what you ought, it's the way you ought to think. Nothing in the Bible can be just describing things. No, we can't have that. You know, frankly, this, all this charge of patriarchal culture needs to be adjusted just a little bit because in many cases, descriptions of patriarchal culture in the Bible are just that. They are descriptions. This is the way people lived. This is the way people thought. It is not laid down as thus says the Lord, you should look at a woman this way. And again, I'm not saying that the older New Testament is the 20th century or the 21st century. I'm not saying that at all. I will say it's better than that it, than it has been characterized by the Da Vinci Code crowd and that this kind of logic is what is driving a lot of their criticism. If something hasn't happened in recorded history, it never happened. Put the resurrection in this one. Well, you know, the only place that's written about is the New Testament. We don't, we're not going to count that. So since we're not going to count that, there's no record of anything else like that, so it must never have happened. Well, thanks. You've just claimed omniscience. You know, I wish I was omniscient. Data and evidence are the same thing. See, data is something like the Gospel of Philip, this reference to Jesus kissing, you know, whatever you know, he kissed. That's a data point. That's a thing which exists that we need to study and think about. It's not evidence of any particular thing yet. That's why we have to think about it. It's just data, right? Evidence and proof are the same thing, are they? Ask a lawyer. Evidence just is. It can be a physical object. It can be a statement. It can be an event. It doesn't constitute proof of anything. Evidence has to be put in context and hopefully lots of data points and lots of evidence are put into the same context so that a picture emerges so that we can draw a conclusion that is quote unquote beyond a reasonable doubt, which means to draw any other conclusion you'd look kind of stupid. Right? That's all that means. But evidence and data and proof are not the same things. But if you read Bajent and Lee's and Lincoln's book, they think just because they found a question or they found a statement somewhere in some book, they will often take it, rip it out, and show it to you in isolation and claim that the data point is now proof of what they want to argue. Meanwhile, they've excluded a whole lot of other data points that would give this one context. And we've seen that today, especially with the discussion on women, especially with the discussion on Jesus as a divine being, especially in relation to the discussion of the New Testament canon. They are notorious for this, taking one data point, ripping it out, orphaning it, showing it to you, and pretending that it's proof to the exclusion of lots of other stuff. But this is the way that you're asked to think. If a field or discipline accepts something as fact, then it probably isn't true. And they probably have sinister reasons for taking that position. Again, just real life demonstrates the silliness of the approach. Discovery of new information means that all old information is invalidated. This is what they want you to believe 
with respect to the Gospels and the manuscripts and all this. Again, what I'm trying to do is reduce their claims to the propositions that they want you to embrace. Discovery of new data means the new data is more reliable and factually trustworthy than the older data. On what grounds? Well, we just didn't know it before, so now we know something different, and that must be true. No one in ancient times wrote with an agenda. Only modern people do that. I could say no one in ancient times except the New Testament writers wrote with an agenda. Like the people who wrote the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Philip or the Gospel of Tom, they didn't have an agenda. No, 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 no. no. That would never have happened. All the Nag Hammadi material is agenda-free material. Just the facts. What bubble were those guys living in? No one with a minority viewpoint in ancient times ever wrote to take a shot at the majority opinion. Only modern people do that. Just a few quotes here uh, that, you know, again, to me, summarize the whole situation. Like I said, I wanted to have a little fun with this one. An education isn't how much you have committed to memory or even how much you know. It's being able to differentiate between what you do know and what you don't. That is an honest handling of evidence, an, an honest handling of material. That is the point of scholarship. Uh, whether Brown sources like to hear it or not, this is what scholars are supposed to do, to try to determine what we can say and what we can't, and to put things really in probability scales. Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Churchill's just wonderful. <laughs> uh, this one kind of speaks for itself. Uh, some, of these, some of these writers, I, I will go as far to say that they probably know where the truth is and they want to avoid it because they don't want to stumble over it. Postmodernists believe that truth is myth and myth truth. This equation has its roots in pop psychology. The same people also believe that emotions are a form of reality. There used to be another name for this state of mind. It used to be called psychosis. <laughs> Brad Holland is an artist. Um, don't know too much about him, but I thought this is pretty profound. And this one we have in our office. The work of scholars is not for sissies. Now, some of you are familiar with Donker. Donker is a famous lexicographer a Greek and early church historian. And frankly, I have this here because I really like the quote because I get to look at it all the time. And also to say that if the people, the sources behind what Brown is writing and perpetuating, again, he to me is not the bad guy. If these guys are not willing to do the grunt work and to look at the texts and give you all the data they're not only sissies, they're axe-grinding sissies. Okay, this is not easy stuff. It is mind-numbing on occasion, but it's important. Just trying to give the data and be honest with it and think about it. Again, non sequitur, a conclusion that does not follow from the preceding premises. And Shakespeare's quote, I think, is a good way to wrap this up. An empty vessel makes the greatest sound. And I think that's what we have in this case. You know, just lacks substance that could be given to the public and still tell a really cool story. But there is apparently an agenda that is being propelled, at least at this point. And maybe it's as simple as, hey, I like being rich. <laughs> maybe it's something deeper than that. I don't know. Questions? I can move right into number eight. Go ahead. I was listening to uh, Gnosis.com or whatever, and they had lectures on there by Dr. Haller. Haller? Yeah. And his, I, his intro to Gnosticism, by the way, is really good. I was fascinated yeah. by what I listened to. 
And, uh, He's a Gnostic, by the way. Good yes. Way. Yeah, I, I gathered that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that he said from my notes is there, I think there is inherent, and I can't find it right off here, but there's an inherent, an inherent necessity to rebel against law and structure and the laws like the Ten Commandments, Torah, because since it originated in, in, from an inferior uh, being, eon, right. that it is necessary for us to rebel against it because it is a means of repressing mm -hmm. us. And that rebellion, if I have the right word, seems really to permeate all of the logic, every, all the, it reminds me of the 70s when um, you know, all the institution was bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just seems to be in, in every part of uh, the literature and your, your quotes, of course, certainly have the, that to them. No, I, I, would, I would agree. I think it's a rebellion against, it's a rebellion against coherence. But that doesn't mean it's the desire to sound stupid. It's not that at all. It, it, it's that I, I know what I want to believe, and even if it's not coherent, I'm still going to believe it because I prefer it over this over here. And you know, who, who knows why people make such choices? I mean, I, I'm willing to think that a lot of it you know, maybe is the church's fault. You know, people are, are victimized in some way, and they go another direction regardless of how how silly the thinking process is that takes them there. But I, I tend to agree that a lot of it is just rebellion. Uh, I don't really know what motivates it. And, I, and I'm willing to say that, you know, I, I don't really find myself too much as part of, a, of a, an institutionalized church. I mean, I, I go to a church that's in a denomination, but I, I frankly never think in those terms because I don't think that's what's important. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not here to perpetuate the livelihood of a particular denomination. Um, but that being said, you know, there is this sense of, of not wanting any, any sort of check and balance on, on thinking, and I don't know what else, what else you'd call that. Yeah, I, I think that there is, there is an element of that for sure. Another question? Yes, Ted. Yeah, I had one. Uh, back to Nicaea, um, those 300 people that were there, or 300 or so people, who were they? I mean, were they local, you know, kings of the area, or who, no, they were, they were the, the cardinals and bishops? Yeah, they were, they, were the, they were the bishops that were, were solicited. I mean, basically the call went out, you know, all through the empire. We're going to have this council at Nicaea, XYZ date. You know, you're invited to come. Some did, some didn't. But they're basically ecclesiastical people, people in position of you know, various positions of the church. Yes? We obviously had some scholarship of uh, a great deal of depth back in the early church and thinking of concepts that uh, pretty much outpace what's in the thought structure of today. What's happened to that type of scholarship and higher level of thought in our quote unquote relig religious uh, institutions and hierarchy. <laughs> yeah, I'm having one of these moments of what I should say and what I want to say. <laughs> um, in, a, in an attempt to be nice, I think part of the problem is a general, the only circles I can really speak for are, are what I have seen in Protestant evangelicalism. And I think that because of, for, for historical reasons, namely the late 19th century on, when you had the rise of Darwinism, and Darwinism as a school of thought permeated the institutions of higher learning and created what became known as the fundamentalist controversies and debates of the early 20th century, that there, that produced an inherent or a systemic suspicion of higher education. Because the universities were the places that were cranking out Darwinism. And uh, you know, it's not just Darwinism, but it's, 
you know, 19th century German philosophy and the things that, were, that, that worked well with a Darwinist scheme, you know, a Darwinist perspective of reality. And, and the, the church was sort of blindsided by this and began to look at institutions of higher learning as just, these are just intellectually speaking dens of iniquity and, and people who go off and, and, and get higher education come out corrupt and, and they don't believe you know the faith and they're just be, it really created an, an, an atmosphere of anti-intellectualism that is still evident to some degree uh, within what, what today would be called fundamentalism even though that's I don't want to mischaracterize it because fundamentalists tend to they, they start their own institutions and they have PhDs like everybody else but in the mid to early 20th century, you just started to get a very anti-intellectual tide within the church. That's one issue. Uh, the other issue, I think, being a little less nice, is just frankly laziness. Uh, we just seem, especially in our culture, to prefer being entertained over thinking. And a lot of what's in the culture reinforces that. Um, you know, it's the old nerd complex, you know, where if, if you're not going to if you're not going to go off and essentially, you know, party and just really be alive to have fun, if you if you want to be serious, you know, what what's the problem with you, kind of thing. In, in the modern church, we just have instances where, I mean, I've actually had Christians come up to me and ask me why I've wasted my life uh, studying the Bible. You know, you're, you're smart, Mike. You could have been a doctor or a lawyer. What are you doing doing this? You could have made a lot of money. I've actually had people tell me that and ask me that. Um, th there is an anti-intellectualism there. I think it's a worldliness that, that we, we tend to look at, at ourselves vocationally for how much money we can accumulate, how much wealth we can accumulate. We are too lazy to want to be intellectually stimulated because it's not going to lead to a profit at least as we can perceive it. I, I think you have all sorts of forces that are, that are intertwined and combined uh, within the church to, to perpetuate an anti-intellectual stance. Um, I'm, I'm, not, and I'm trying not to make a too sweeping of a generalization because I know lots of Christians with PhDs in all sorts of fields that really care you know, about learning and, and you know, sciences or humanities or whatever. But, but the lay community, people like you are the unusual ones. I hope you realize that. Um, to, to me, you know, having you know, a, a lay person uh, or someone who, who has no, you know, who maybe didn't go to grad school, just the, the average person, you, know, you, you get into adulthood and it's like, man, I want to learn lots of stuff. I just find it interesting. I'd rather go read this book than go watch American Idol. I mean, that's wonderful. You know, to meet people like that. I've had grandmas in their 60s order my dissertation from my website. And they'll tell me, I don't know Hebrew or Greek, but I've read everything else on your website, and this is what's left. I mean, I, I wish we had more of that. But the, the reality is we don't. And I don't think, I think it's because it's just not valued, because it, it's, not, it's not a money thing. I think the church is, is just very worldly. I mean, I don't, I don't know any, any other way to say it. I think it's misplaced priorities. I think churches should make their pastors be theologians and hire theologians on staff. That's the way it used to be. You know, theologians aren't exciting, but the church rises or falls on, on their backs. You know, speaking outside of Providence now. But it's because of guys like Athanasius who attended the Council of Nicaea as a lowly secretary that we have the Nicene Creed. You know, because he saw through the issues very clearly and articulated, you know, said what needed to be said because he had, he had the, the, the intellectual bandwidth to do it. You know, he wasn't alone by any means. You know, you probably read some, quite a bit of the early church fathers' writings. Just in reading. They're amazing the, guys. Oh, the thought process is like, Outside of serious, serious Catholicism and maybe Anglicanism, 
the, the fathers have just been neglected everywhere. Now, I, I will say one thing uh, and, and give credit to where credit's due. Uh, InterVarsity Press, which is predominantly uh, selling books to the evangelical midstream commentary, which is a book-by-book -book commentary from the church fathers on every book of the Bible. Uh, that plus the church father writing, church father's writings themselves, I think, are a step in the right direction. We're, we're sensitive to that too at Logos. We, we license InterVarsity stuff for electronic use. It's, it's wonderful to be able to search it because th these guys were just, you know, you could, you could, you know, you'd probably have to replace any one of them with three or four other people now that have PhDs. You know, it, the, they. They were just really amazing people. Well, that's for uh, more kind of evolution and the thought process doesn't stand up when you, yeah. when you put the majority next to them. You, just, I, you know, I, I know, I know guys who you know who do doctoral work in philosophical theology, and that's that you're doing a lot of stuff with the fathers there. But that's that's even rarer than a guy who goes into Semitic languages like me, because. It's the old, well, if you go and study philosophy, all you're going to do is flip burgers or drive a cab. Never thinking that maybe we should send this guy to grad school to be a, a philosophical theologian and hire him on staff and have him actually write things for the lay audience so that they learn how to think again. I'm not, un, I'm not naive enough to think that's going to happen. But that, that used to be the norm. Another question? Okay, well, let's break just a minute or two and do the last thing.